Before continuing, this analysis is broken into two parts due to its original length. This video is part one of two. Well, hi there, idiots. Welcome back to Observe. In today's video, we're going to be analyzing the nonverbal communication of producer Dan Schneider. More on him in just a second. Let's go ahead and roll the intro first. Okay, so as I mentioned, this video is about Dan Schneider. For those of you who do not know, there has been a recent documentary released over on Max as of right now that is describing the, the climate of the set of Nickelodeon for various Nickelodeon shows, all of them produced by Dan Schneider, the complexities behind that. If you haven't watched that docuseries, I heavily suggest you go and watch that. Dan Schneider has, as of right now, been removed from these producer roles in various shows and is facing a large amount of backlash for the content of this docuseries, not the least of which is inappropriate behavior towards children and also various other cast members and crew members on sets, in writing rooms, the list goes on. So, in response to this docuseries coming out and the allegations therein, Dan Schneider has released a video, uh, an apology video of sorts, but I'm going through the entirety of the video and analyzing what I can see non-verbally from that. I think that that's enough of the backstory for this. I think it's better for us to just go ahead and start watching the content itself. Let's dive in. Hey, it's Boogie. I play T-Ball and Nickelodeon's iCarly. I got a chance to watch the Quiet On Set program and I reached out to Dan to see if it was something that he'd be willing to discuss. I'm pleased to say that he said yes. Dan, how are you? I'm okay. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and pause here initially just to establish some things. So Boogie here, some people have been passing around the idea that that him and Dan are friends. I was not able to track down any sources that state clearly that Dan and Boogie are actually friends. However, as we continue through this interview, you will see very clearly the dynamic that exists between the two of them, especially in regards to the allegations that are being presented. So as there are very complex and intense allegations, we will not see Boogie push on that besides some light nudging in certain directions. Everything that comes from Boogie during this time is very supportive of Dan Schneider, which calls into question the reliability of this interview altogether. That is just a little bit of a backstory and precursor to this interview. Let's go ahead and see uh, Dan Schneider's response here. Uh, right here, right before I pause it, he does a pretty substantial mouth shrug, which is a level of uncertainty, perhaps in security, but it does line up with what he says verbally as far as the mm, I don't know side of things. So we're seeing that play out here. Let's go ahead and just continue on through all of this footage. There's a lot to unpack. Okay. I'm okay. Um, I really appreciate you reaching out and giving me the opportunity to talk to you about the, what we saw over the last two nights. I'm really glad you're here because I believe this is important. For sure. Uh, We've got a lot of things to unpack. I'm going to go ahead and pause here. Some things that I will know about Dan Schneider's nonverbal communication in this specific interview is there's a substantial amount of what appears to be eye blocking gestures. So prolonged blinks that would be separation from the subject and what the subject is talking about or any of the things that are being talked about around the subject itself. So we'll see that come out a number of times. However, since it is so regular, it's not something that I can necessarily rely on as a tell of deceit or just possible desynchronization, which could put Push us down that avenue of exploring deceit. So that can't necessarily be relied on. However, I will also say that in his response to this, he also has a bit of a no shake in there as he's talking. And that could be an indicator of desynchronization in between the in between what he's saying and what he's actually displaying. So he's saying it's his pleasure to do dot dot dot, but he's shaking his head no. Possible desynchronization, not really enough to go off of this early on in the interview itself, but it is already starting to pop up. So with that in mind let's continue watching things to unpack um but before i dive into my list of topics that i'd like to discuss is there anything you'd like to start off with absolutely watching over the past two nights was very difficult me facing my past behaviors um some of which are embarrassing and that i regret and i definitely owe some people a pretty strong apology 
All right, gonna go pause there. So we're seeing some no shakes in there as he's saying they're embarrassing. That no shake that's in there is sent around two possibilities. Either one, it's a desynchronization point as he's saying a certain thing, but shaking his head to quite literally counteract that. Or since it is fairly macro, it might be centered around that you wouldn't believe, which if it is centered around that, that indicates a level of self-awareness from Schneider and that he's he's believe or he's stating with his nonverbal communication that you might not believe, but I feel dot dot dot. So we're saying we're seeing that being stated by Schneider in here. And then along with that, we're seeing a little teeny tiny bit of a lopsided shrug in there, which is an indicator of insecurity or insincerity. So there's there's some insecurity or insincerity centered around that statement there, as indicated by the, the lopsided shoulder shrug. There's the possibility of desynchronization in there as well. So at the very early stage, it's setting the tone for me to on some level be a little bit suspicious of what he's about to say. Now, in order to try to maintain as much of an unbiased opinion as possible, we have to set that on the back burner as we continue forward, but it is something to make note of and to keep track of, especially if things like that start to pile up as opposed to areas that would push us towards authenticity, then that helps us understand a lot more what the mindset behind Dan Schneider's words are as opposed to what the actual words are saying themselves. And there is a pretty decent separation between those two as we'll continue on through this, especially if you've watched the actual documentary, which again, I cannot stress enough, go watch the documentary, but I'm assuming you've probably already watched it and that's why you're here. So let's, let's just watch through this. Let's talk about the massages. Okay. Watching the content yesterday, it was disturbing. It was wrong. It was wrong that I ever put anybody in that position. It was the wrong thing to do. I'd never do it today. I'm embarrassed that I did it then. I apologize to anybody that I ever put in that situation. And even additionally, I apologize to the people who were walking around Video Village or wherever they happened because there were lots of people there who witnessed it who also may have felt uncomfortable. So I owe them an apology as well. Yeah. Gonna go ahead and pause here. So it was wrong. We're seeing some substantial no shaking in there that could be desynchronization. However, due to the fact that it is so macro, I am encouraged to believe that it is consciously controlled. Now that it is wrong, that seems like a positive and affirmative action. It is dot 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 while he's shaking his head as if it would not be. So there's the possibility of it being desynchronized even on that front. However, it would also line up quite clearly with the you would not believe, but I believe it was wrong. So there is that possibility. Still muddy for sure. We're still seeing the lopsided shrugs coming in there. And even during portions as he's talking about how unacceptable the behavior was, we're seeing a little bit of disgust come into the corner of his nose. So we're seeing some nonverbal tells that seem to perhaps be affirmative to what he's saying and the words that he's saying are true it was wrong there was no excuse and it was extremely problematic behavior especially considering the age group of people that he was regularly working with again this is nickelodeon so it's largely children minors and so with that in mind we're also getting this air of which many people have been catching on to the the response does not match the level of the allegations and the proof shown by the people that have been presenting their stories. So we're seeing some disconnect already, but this is so early on in the interview. Let's just keep watching. Yeah. Dan, talk to me about the writer's room. From what I saw, not cool. No. No, and I, I don't mean to cut you off, but if I can cut right to the chase, let me just... I'm going to go ahead and pause here. So something that I will know about the rapport between the two of them, they're obviously on first name basis. Dan, talk to me, dot, dot, dot. Again, it has not been, as far as I could see, verbatim stated in any other news outlet or source that I could find that they were close friends or on a friendship level, but the dynamic between the two of them, especially non-verbally, does push me heavily into that avenue. If they weren't counting themselves as friends, they were certainly not on opposite sides of this scenario. It seems as though it's two people trying to clear one person's name, and that's more implicative of Boogie, but we're not focusing on Boogie during this, we're focusing on Mr. Schneider. So with that in mind, let's keep watching that. Chase, let me just say, no writer should ever feel uncomfortable in any writer's room, ever, period, the end, no excuses. Um, most TV writers, comedy writers have been in writer's rooms and they are aware that a lot of times there are inappropriate jokes made and inappropriate topics come up. Uh, but the fact that I participated in that, especially when I was leading the room, um, it embarrasses me. I shouldn't have done it. Um, and, and I can tell you why it hurts really 
back. Okay, let me go ahead and pause here. So something that he's doing, that Schneider's doing during all of this, he's saying, well, you see, and he'll use phrases like, well, look here, or you see, or the thing is something like that. So he'll I'll offer a clarifier that then allows him to pack more information in there. So there's a number of possible reasons for that extra packing of information. However, the things that he starts to pack into this information packing that he's doing are fascinating. The, uh, no writer should ever feel uncomfortable in the writer. That's very true. That's a no duh. That's obvious. So him reiterating that is just him trying to build rapport to us and to the interviewer. I understand what these are. So no writer should do dot dot dot. And then he starts to go into the rest of it. And he says, all writers understand, especially in a comedy thing, that there's going to be some inappropriate joking, something along those lines, which is him simply begging and playing the numbers game. Everybody else does this, so when it's done in this area, it should be more anticipated. So it is a low level of manipulation that pops up immediately in there. And again, this is not just a comedy set. This is a children's comedy set. And there should be very, very clear parameters between what children comedy and adult comedy can allow. There should not be any overlap in between the two, especially in these producing circles and the writing circles that we're speaking of here. So he's trying to also then claim, well, it's just the way things are, which is an awful reason to do terrible things. So we're seeing that. And then he starts to finally, after offering these two manipulative qualifiers, he then starts to be like, and I shouldn't have done any of that. There isn't any excuse for any of that. And all of that is verbally very true. No, shouldn't have done any of that. There should not be any excuse for any of that. And the repercussions for that should be adequately severe as to the problematic behavior itself. And so far in this little two minutes that we've watched. We haven't seen Dan try to wriggle out of the consequences of his actions yet, but we'll have to continue watching on through this to understand more as we go. Hurts really bad for me. Um, I remember very clearly my early experiences, my first experiences in the entertainment business. I was green. I was scared. I was excited. It, it meant the world to me that I was getting those opportunities. And I went in and I got lucky because they were great. My first couple of experiences were fantastic. And the fact that... Mm questionable there so he's going through and he's explaining his his you know introduction into the entertainment industry and then when he's starting to say they were good and they were great he looks down into the side which that breaking of eye contact like i said he has that fairly regularly where he breaks eye contact there might be some prolonged blinks in there and that's so common throughout the entirety of this interview that it makes it difficult to be able to understand whether or not there's a psychological processing behind it or if it's just something that he does but in this area it does line up suspiciously close with it was fantastic Fantastic. And he looks down to the side and he does have a micro no shake in there, which there's the possibility somebody can do a micro no shake, especially if you're consciously controlling every single aspect of your nonverbal communication. Adding a micro movement in there is a possibility. He doesn't seem to be doing that elsewhere and it doesn't seem to be how he's presenting nonverbally elsewhere. So when it pops up in this area, it makes me feel a little suspicious. There are some questions around that that perhaps his first experience in the entertainment industry wasn't as amazing or as good as he's saying. Now, why that might be that he's trying to twist that that fact a little bit, I'm not certain. I don't know if it sets the tone for other steps in his career. I don't know if that en enables him emotionally to, to justify some of his other behaviors. I'm not certain. However, that desynchronization does seem to pop up there. So we'll make note of that and add that to our collection of various things that we're seeing already. Let's just continue. That... that and the fact that I didn't pay that forward to every employee that walked through my door, yeah. it, it, it hurts my heart because I should have. And I wish I could go back and fix that. Um, in the writer's room, there's no doubt that sometimes those jokes went beyond the pale and I said things that went too far or made practical jokes that went too far. And um, that was wrong. And that. Okay. So, again, throughout this, as he's talking about the earlier half of this little segment that we're watching, we're seeing some grimace come into his face. And this grimace is an indicator of pain, which can be easily controlled consciously. It's very. Uh, Despite the, the the difficulty around nonverbal communication, most people on the face of the planet are used to having to lie with their face at very least. So seeing some of these things that are more overtly produced and presented, it it always runs the distinct possibility and the risk of being fake. So we're seeing that pain come in there. 
It's curious, other areas that are less likely to be controlled are throughout the rest of the body, as people aren't used to lying with the rest of their body. They're, you're, they're, you're used to lying with your face because that's the main communicator. But we're seeing the ins insecurity shrugs come in there, possible insecurity or insincerity, as I've stated again and again. So those centered in there, as well as he's talking about these various things, leads me to believe at very least he's feeling insecure on this, even possibly insincere on this, which we can't say that this is insincerity to begin with because we don't have enough information around it to go off of, but considering the other little collection of red flags that we're already starting to see and problematic behavior that we've already started to see, there is the distinct possibility that this would be in that group as well. Let's continue. And that, that was because, you know, I was an inexperienced producer. I was immature. Wouldn't happen today, but um, I'm just really sorry it happened. Yeah. Interesting. For each of these points that he's saying, he looks up towards the interviewer, towards Boogie. So I was an inexperienced. I did this and then wouldn't happen today. So instead of this pattern that he's shown of, he wants to look up at somebody to ensure that they're understanding. And then when it gets to the problematic one of it wouldn't happen today, that's where we're seeing a pretty substantial break off into the side that we hadn't seen before. It is a little bit of a red flag. It's just something to keep note of. There's not enough again around it to say, oh, definitely lying there. He looked away. So that means that means deceit because it's it's never that cut and dry. It's never that black and white for anybody who's been involved in sociology and psychology in general. There's a lot of gray areas because of our lack of understanding as to how the human mind processes and the relation between emotional processing and psychological processing and physical displays of emotion, aka nonverbal communication. So there are still so many gray areas to work with so we just have to collect and continue forward and work with as many data points as we can work with as we form our opinion as what's going on here so we're understanding a little bit let's continue watching yeah now we know you've had a lot of success over two decades thousands of people have worked with you for you okay. let's speak directly to the people who did not have a good experience with you okay i would like to speak to those people because i hate that anybody worked for me and didn't have a good time you know me you've been on my sets little thing i don't know that it's necessarily something of substance but while he's speaking about i would like to speak to those people he does a, a very light eye roll in there which that eye roll is a level of dismissal it downplays the validity of the mentioned subject or topic so we're seeing that eye roll in there as he's talking about the people who did not have a good experience working for him. That perhaps subconscious level of dismissal is something that seems to be a, a very common characteristic of Dan Schneider in certain circumstances on set and behind the scenes. So with that in mind, let's keep watching. On my sets, um, look, I've had some employees that have worked for me for 10 years, some more than 20 years who would work with me again but um, not everybody. There's a, still a significant number that didn't have a great time working for me. So my batting average isn't nearly high enough in that area. Um, I go ahead and pause here. He again starts his statement with a look. This is a dominating statement. That look, it sets up a person of an explainer as opposed to an, uh, a new receiver of information. So there's a power play that's in there. Obviously, Schneider is revealing some sort of information that perhaps Boogie wouldn't be privy to, which is not the case. It's very straightforward and obvious information, but he still does that. And then he again tries to play this numbers game where he was saying that there, you know, there are just a lot of people that really did still want to work with me and would work with me for X amount of years, a decade more, two decades even, but not everybody would feel that way. So he's again trying to play this numbers game. What he's mathematically saying is that they, they don't matter as much. And he tries to verbally go back on that right afterwards by covering his butt. And so he says something lighthearted like, oh, my, my batting average on that isn't as high as I would like it to be. Again, downplaying the severity of the situation and still playing that numbers game. A lot of people liked me. Some didn't. My batting average wasn't great. I should change that. It does not match the severity. It does not match the implications. And as many people have called Schneider out in this, it feels as though this is just an attempt for him to cover his own ass during a very problematic time. Fascinating stuff. Let's continue watching. Yeah. Um, and the way they wouldn't get the best of me is that I would let the pressure of doing 40 or even more episodes per year 
I would let that pressure get to me, which a good boss should never, ever do. Was there specific things that you were doing? Sh sure. I would um, snap at people sometimes. Mm -hmm. I would be snarky when I could have given them a nicer answer. Um, I would not give people the time that they needed. I would be in too big a hurry to get on to the next thing I had to do. And watching that show, it made me, there were so many times I wanted to pick up a phone and call some of those people and say, I'm so sorry and let's talk about it. And I, I wish you'd had a better time and I wish I could have shown you a better experience. Yeah. Gonna go ahead and pause here. So from Boogie, we're seeing a lot of affirmative head nods. We're never seeing any conflict coming from Boogie, even non-verbally. He's always affirmative of what Dan is saying, always supportive of what Dan is saying. And that does not change throughout the entirety of the interview, again, throwing into question the validity and reliability of his questioning and whether or not he was able to push to a point of getting to the actual truth of the matter. And then along with that, Schneider's having a, an easy time here just saying, yeah, I shouldn't have done all of these terrible things that I did do. And then the things he, is he, he starts trying to list these things that he did wrong and he downplays them each time. Oh, well, maybe I was a little quick with somebody sometimes. And sometimes I was a little bit more snarky than I should have been. And that's not the descriptor that cast and crew described Dan Schneider's presence on set as being. Uh, there was a portion in the docu-series itself where he was described as as a hurricane going through set that he would come through and it would just be a blast of negativity and shouting and demands and commands and then he would go on through and everybody would just be in shock and that style of of leadership and that style of producing is is vastly different than what he's describing here where maybe he was a little bit short or uh, a little bit extra snarky something along those lines now this does beg into question uh something that floats around often in the film community is whether or not a producer can be a nice kind person and still get results or does a producer kind of have to be a jerk and there's a whole lot of complexity into that and there is a balance that can be struck and obviously Schneider did not hit that balance as made very evident by the numerous people that have come forward with various levels of evidence speaking about his conduct so we're seeing some problematic behaviors already from Dan Schneider and his responses to those problematic behaviors are not at the level that the problematic behaviors demand so we're <laughs> needless to say so far this has all been problematic let's keep watching yeah now you've written hundreds of episodes thousands of jokes have been told yeah but currently where we are uh -huh. some people think that some of those jokes are inappropriate for children uh -huh. what do you think of that <sighs> all these jokes that you're speaking of um, that the show covered over the past two nights. Every one of those jokes was written for a kid audience because kids thought they were funny mm -hmm. and only funny. Okay. Um, now we have some adults looking back at them 20 years later through their lens and they're looking at them and they're saying, oh, you know, I don't think that's appropriate for, for a kid show. Mm -hmm. And I have no problem with that. If, if that's how anyone feels, Let's cut those jokes out of the show, just like I would have done 20 years ago or 25 years ago. I cut it. I want my shows to be popular. I want everyone to like it. The more people who like the show is the happier I am. Yeah. So if there's anything in a show that needs to be cut because it's upsetting somebody, let's cut it. So I think it's big for you to I'm going to go ahead and pause here because there's a number of things that obviously happen here, not the least of which we'll start with the cutting of the episodes. Many people have been questioning this, not only because of the dynamic that Dan himself had shown on set, he was not much of one to take negative feedback well. So the fact that he's just saying, oh yeah, just cut it. People are suspicious of that. He didn't do it at the time, even if things were, even if like issues were raised with it, he didn't do it then. And something else that was stated very clearly in the documentary is that he had a mindset of slipping in these very inappropriate jokes into the kids' things as an inside joke for the writers, for the producers, for the editors, things along those lines. He wanted to see if he could more or less fool the general public 
into getting these jokes in here. And so what people are now noticing is that he's saying, oh, well, if people had had an issue with it, then I would have just cut it, aka if I had been caught then, then I would have removed it. And now he's being caught and he's claiming that he would remove it. But my question is, based off of simple patterning alone, if he spent the majority of his career before trying to get these inappropriate and knowledgeably inappropriate, it wasn't like he was oopsie poopsie, I made an inappropriate joke, my bad. That wasn't the situation there. He was making inappropriate jokes with the attempt to get it to fly under the radar. And if he did that then, what would make us possibly consider him changing his his approach now it's problematic behavior and it's again him saying that he's sorry for certain things without being able to offer any form of actual evidence that this is a genuine apology and many people don't believe that he would just cut it and even when he's starting to say just cut it you can hear the the intensity the emotional intensity behind his words spike up as he's saying that you hear the pitch increase you hear the strain behind his voice increase and it raises a red flag even non-verbally with that spike coming from his prior baseline. Every single tell that I see here, there are a number of possibilities as to what they can mean. It's considering the context and the character of the person that we're working with that helps us understand a little bit more as to where we're going. Again, not black and white, unfortunately, but we can get to a fairly dark shade of gray. So let's keep watching. So I think it's big for you to say with your work, mm -hmm. if it's viewed as that today, you don't have a problem. Cut it. Cut it. I mean, that's a solution. The, the last thing I want to ever do yeah. is put any content in a show that's going to upset my audience and make them want to turn off the TV. Why would I ever want to do that? That makes sense. I want to give you an opportunity to... So with that, again, we're hearing Boogie exclusively. It's almost like he's hyping up Schneider throughout the entirety of this. Really wants Schneider to be relaxed, to be confident, to say their side of the story. It doesn't feel like there's any form of, I'm asking questions for the people that deserve answers. It feels like... I'm presenting Dan Schneider with an opportunity to provide a level of excuses for you. And that's the exclusive role of Boogie throughout this. Many people are extremely upset with him for orchestrating the interview in this way. It doesn't feel like it's there for the benefit of anybody else other than Dan Schneider. Let's continue watching. To need to kind of elaborate on something. Okay. The thought process from the series is you had the power to just write a joke and no matter what, it's going on TV. You just had that type of power. Is that true? The, the notion that I had the power to just produce whatever I wanted and have it air is completely false. Okay. There were many, many levels of scrutiny. Okay. We had executives in LA. We had executives in New York. So two coasts. Two coasts okay. of, of, of approval. Coasts. Yes. And, not, and by the way, approval at every stage, really. Okay. And I'm talking about wardrobe. I'm talking about makeup, sound, sets, dialogue, jokes, everything. Now, when you say approval, these obviously that's a hierarchy, not your no. colleagues right. or people in the room. Okay. No, no, not my colleagues. No, these are my bosses. Bosses and then their bosses and then their bosses. And they're approving all of this stuff. Okay. Okay. And we're also shooting it in front of all sorts of adults and caregivers and the set teacher and, and the families, everybody's watching it. And if anybody had said anything, hey, we don't like that, that's not appropriate, you then it would have been cut out. Now, I'm gonna, I'm gonna- Gonna go ahead and pause here. So again, we're getting the feeling that Boogie is just hand-holding Schneider throughout all of this, problematic in and of itself. And then what Schneider is talking about is fascinating to me because speaking from some small set experience, it does fall in line with what I have seen, that what the writer has to write or the producer has to say is run through a level of checks and balances, more or less, to make sure that it gets approved. That's not really what the question is here. It's not that he didn't have those checks and balances. It's more so what people are saying is that since he was the golden child, the producer, where everything that he touched turned to gold, they didn't have the willingness to push back on it. So he would say, Hey, X, Y, Z, and they would be like, he makes so, he's so profitable for the company. We can't say anything about it. That's what's being brought up. So his response of no, 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 no. There are a lot of people. There are people on two coasts who give a flying rat's ass about how many coasts are involved in the approval. Nobody's arguing that. Sure. It could have run through all of these different things. The issue is that the people that it ran through didn't have the backbone or the, the wherewithal to stand up to Dan because he was too profitable for the company. 
It all boiled down to money. That's the actual point of the issue, not what Dan's trying to say here. So Dan tries to go through and say all of these different things and then use that as justification. It's a it's a weaselly answer to the question itself. It's something that answers without answering. We've caught on. We see that. It, it doesn't work. It doesn't matter how many checks and balances there are. If all of the people aren't going to stand up to the person going through the checks and balances, they're just, they're just, dead weight. It doesn't do anything. It's still the same pipeline. He has an idea. It goes to screen. So that can still exist with all of those. I think I've clarified that. Let's keep watching. I'm going to push back a little bit sure. because the series mm -hmm. painted you in this way that you were just the guy that was doing what he wanted and mm -hmm. people were afraid to confront you about things. So say, just humor me, say that that was the case. What would have been the ultimate way to... Okay. If nobody on the set, if you just want to say something non-verbally from Boogie again, that's a, it's really just reinforcing this concept that he's there for Schneider. So he's getting defensive. He still shows defensive uh, uh, non-verbal communication. Hand down, pushing away, light palm forward. That defensiveness comes in there, dominating. And then you hear the pitch increase. But as he's saying, say this was what happened here, you see very substantial conscious no shakes in there. Now, either one, unbelievable. Why is it unbelievable? Not sure. Maybe because it's unbelievable. Or two, there's a negative emotion related to what he's saying there, which is he's priming Dan for being able to respond. Oh, well, that's not the case. He's non-verbally priming him by being like, yeah, say all of these people said these things. Now, if you saw somebody shaking their head like crazy like that while saying somebody said something, are are you more likely to believe them while they're displaying that nonverbal communication? Or if somebody's like, now, people were saying this stuff. This was bad stuff. No, people were saying this stuff. It was so bad. There's a distinctly different tone to the nonverbal communication there that Boogie is giving out, again, letting us know Dan Schneider is just getting himself the platform to say, I didn't do any of these things. Let's keep watching. On the set, if all of the dozens and dozens of adults that were on the set, if they didn't say anything, if my bosses said, if they insisted, you've got to make a change here, you got to cut that. I had to do it. I had no choice. Got it. Okay. Nobody's questioning that. What people are questioning is if they would do that. Like, it's not if they could do that, because they could. That's how the workflow works. There's hierarchy that is involved in sets and screenwriting. That's not the question on if they could do that. But if they would is a very different situation. And from what we're hearing from people on the set as well, they weren't. They weren't doing that. So even though it's a possibility, it wasn't a probability. And because of that problematic jokes and scenes and concepts made it onto children's programming to be aired across the globe. And that's problematic. Let's keep watching. Now this next one, it kind of hit close to home. Mm -hmm. uh, being a new father, I wouldn't be opposed of, to my child being in the entertainment industry. No, I'm going to go ahead and pause that there. That's problematic in and of itself. Just that line alone from Boogie. Now, obviously, everybody can parent how they want to parent as long as the kid is receiving the necessary beneficial things in life that they need. Arguably, I have never seen, spoken to, or heard of a singular adult who either went through child stardom or has had children in it that suggests it for a kid. Also, seeing mm, many hundreds of child actors go through Hollywood, go through these production sets, and come out on the other side far worse off than what they could have been is extremely common. So for Boogie to be like, yeah, I would have no problem inserting my child into into Hollywood, more or less, I find that as a pretty substantial red flag for his mindset alone. Now, that's just my personal thing. There's no nonverbal situation around that. There's no nonverbal tells for it. There's no body language pointing me in that. That's just a problem that I have with Boogie specifically. Fascinating. Let's keep watching. It doesn't matter what age. Yeah. Seeing some of those on-air dares. Seeing it now from where you are now in your life. What do you think of that? I think that some of the on-air dares went too far. I think they pushed the envelope too far. Not all of them, not most of them, but some did. Nickelodeon wanted to do their version of Fear Factor. At the Correct me if I'm wrong. 
for any of you who are in childcare. I don't care if it's nannying, I don't care if it's teaching, child care of some form. You are overviewing, supervising children. How many times have you thought to yourself, I want to push the envelope of what's acceptable to do to these children? Just please fill up the comments below. I, I'm, I am genuinely curious. I might be a little judgmental if you're sitting there being like, I really want to push the envelope and I have done pushing of the proverbial envelope as to what is acceptable to do to a child. Woo! So just the mindset alone of like, yeah, we want to push the envelope for what is acceptable to do to children in a fear factor sort of way is extremely problematic in and of itself. Care for children? and pushing the proverbial envelope of acceptability should never be in the same paragraph, sentence, concept, thought, ever. Nevertheless, we're hearing from Dan that he willingly created scenarios that pushed the envelope a little too much. Again, one thing, if they were fully consenting adults, like on Fear Factor, something along those lines, but we're dealing, dealing with minors. And in my personal and humble opinion, envelopes should not be involved. Just consider being always safe for the children. Just for the sake of them, why would you ever even consider in your adult, fully developed brain, let's subject the kids to that. This is all problematic so far. Let's keep watching. At the time we were shooting all that, so I was tasked with doing these on-air dares with the All That cast. So we get with the writers and we come up with all these ideas and it's hard to do because we don't have the budget of fear factor sure. and we can't put the kids in dangerous situations like the adults are put in. So kids. it was hard to, yeah, hard to come up with stuff, but we would come up with all these ideas of dares they could do. We would uh, uh, give them to the network and then they would say, one, tell us the ones that were okay. Right. Those are the ones we shot. Those are the ones that aired. At the time, I had no indication that any kid ever had a problem with them. But when I was watching the show over the past two nights, I now know that there were kids who did have problems with the on-air dares. And it breaks my heart. And I'm so sorry. I am so sorry to any kid who ever had to do a dare or anything that they didn't want to do or weren't comfortable doing. We went out of our way to make sure they were safe and, and that everything was done properly. But if a kid was scared and didn't want to do it, kids shouldn't have had to do it. Yeah. Period. The end. Right. And if I had known at the time, I would, I would have changed it on the spot. Okay. So he says a lot of positive things. He keeps saying that he would put out this list to the uppers that he was dealing with, his managers, the people that had to approve his ideas, and they would approve it. And he's using that as an excuse. Well, they said it was fine, so it's fine. And in my mind, and I believe in the mind of many people watching, that's not the case. We're not looking at that and being like, oh, well, at least a bunch of people said that it's good to do terrible things to the kids. That makes it fine. It's again, a numbers game and it's a shifting of responsibility. It's a manipulation point. He is dodging responsibility while still trying to verbally say that he's taking some level of responsibility. He's not. This is all still just covering his butt. Let's keep watching. Now we also saw the series highlight two former writers viewers, two women mm -hmm. who spoke about a wage discrepancy. Now, I know that you don't divvy out salaries. Talk to me about that part. Well, you're correct. I have nothing to do with paying writers. I never have. I've never made a writer's deal. And of all the writers I've been in a writer's room with, I never even knew how much most of them were getting paid. Yeah. Mm, going to go ahead and pause here. Speaking on that workflow, that, that whole system of pay, it is not from what I could understand and from my own small, like I said, small experience, it is not up to the producer how much each person gets paid. That's not their job. There's a different section of the business that deals with that. The way that most sets function does support that line. So that I would, I would kind of more believe that he didn't necessarily have uh, a control over that directly. He wasn't the one writing the checks, perhaps. Maybe there was more influence that he had, especially if he's the quote unquote golden child, he might have more influence over what people are paid or what happens to various cast members or crew members, perhaps, but he, the producer, is not in control of cutting the paychecks. 
that's fair. And then he goes through and he's saying that he wouldn't have done all of these things. And then he said he wouldn't, if, if he had seen these things happen, he wouldn't have even let. And he adds that, that qualifier of even in there. And that is separate from the other times of other things that he was listing. So that, that spike in his verbal communication, that change, that alteration that's in there is a little bit of a red flag towards that statement. We're gathering more and more and more about the character behind Dan Schneider. This is all that will be covered in this first video. Please stay tuned and consider subscribing for part two.